consider yourself self-disciplined? Most people don't. According to a study from 2006, self-control is rated among the least prevalent of 24 character strengths by adults in 54 nations. And yeah, self-control is a little bit different, but it's part of it, right? So what is self-discipline anyways? It's the mind's ability to govern the body. So whereas self-discipline is concerned with more conscious judgments about conduct, self-control concerns emotions and the things that we do reflexively to defend our bodies and our egos when they're under attack. So to me, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. My actions and output versus my reactivity. And although that 2006 study is only one side of that coin, it tells me that people act more on impulse and are led by their emotions rather than by their goals or the person that they aim to be. We tend to choose what feels good in the moment versus what's actually good for us. But the reality is we might all actually be a little more disciplined than we give ourselves credit for. I mentioned in this interview that a lot of people comment on my self-discipline and sometimes it takes me by surprise. But then again, I am the one person who witnesses every single time that I choose the dopamine <laughs> over the long-term fulfillment. So it's easy to focus more on our failures than on our successes. Our brains are literally wired to seek out the negative. But what I've noticed is that while I am super disciplined in some areas, there are other areas in which discipline feels almost impossible. And we see it all the time. The successful CEO who eats crap and can't manage to stick to his workouts. Or the fitness fanatic who struggles to keep up with the business side of things. Or the daily meditator with the shopping addiction. <laughs> That's kind of me. So why can we show up as our best selves in one area, but then struggle in another? The reason varies. Maybe you developed a habit for working out a long time ago and can't seem to figure out how to make a new habit of writing every day. Or maybe one action fits easier with your current lifestyle than another one. But regardless of the surface level reason, there's almost always a deeper reason. And that deeper reason is usually that you haven't yet connected that hard thing with a deeper why. Your motivation for becoming the person who does this new thing isn't quite strong enough yet. And for me, this new thing isn't working out or meditating or working harder or any new habit, really. It's the choice to become self-disciplined in general. I want self-discipline to become that habit or that way of life. Because yes, I can build a new habit and then I can build another one, but as helpful as they are, I don't just want new habits. I want to become the type of person who makes a decision and sticks to it. I want to be the type of person who is always acting toward the person that I want to be rather than giving in to distraction and temptation. Because once I cultivate self-discipline, all of it's possible. So whether you need help building a consistent morning routine, breaking bad habits, finding your life purpose, increasing motivation and willpower, achieving your goals, or just being more effective with your time. Mindful self-discipline can help. So that's what we're talking about today. And our guest is Giovanni Dinsman. He is a self-discipline coach who's helped hedge fund managers, CEOs, entrepreneurs, celebrity musicians, ambitious professionals, artists, and pro athletes to live a more focused, disciplined life. And since 2014, he has been successfully coaching people to overcome distractions, procrastination, self-doubt, fear, and other forms of self-sabotage. So three key things that we will learn are why habits alone are not good enough, why you need to be goal-oriented and process-oriented, and the three pillars of mindful self-discipline. Welcome to the show, Giovanni. Thank you, Melissa. It's a pleasure to be here. So what is your journey with self-discipline? Why are you focused on it with this book? Mm -hmm. So uh, throughout my life, people have always been surprised how disciplined and organized I am with certain things. And they ask, how, how can you do this? How can you kind of do the same things every day, do meditation for an hour every morning and, and never break that habit? How, how do you do that? And for me, it was like, 
I, I really care about this. Like I, I have a goal, I have an aspiration. So I, I'm, I'm working on it. It, it felt like uh, second nature. Um, but people having were having a lot of trouble with this and, and asking my advice. And then I started coaching. I was already a meditation teacher and started coaching people with self-discipline. And then I realized that there's, there's a lot to self-discipline. And in this journey of me wanting to write a book on this topic, I myself became more self-disciplined. And looking back, I felt like I have I had a little bit of self-discipline, but now now I understand the the real depth and importance of this topic. Were you always that way, even as a child? So I had some aspects of self-discipline, um, like self-control. I remember when I was a kid, I would get a uh, a box of uh, small chocolates that in Brazil we call them bonbon. It's like a small wrapped chocolate, and I would get something like that for um, my birthday. And I'll tell myself I only eat two per day so that it lasts a long time. And I was eight or nine. And so nobody taught me <laughs> that it just came from within. So some aspects of self-discipline I had to some degree, but um, many other aspects like perseverance, these are things that, and, and patience did, did not come natural to me. I had to um, conquer those qualities. We were opposite children, that's for sure. I would not have passed the marshmallow test. <laughs> but oh, I'm curious though, because you said that you were viewed as self-disciplined. And then once you really started diving in and learning about it, you realized you had some work to do and now you're embodying it a lot more. So what did you learn about self-discipline? What What is it and what changed mm. in your understanding of it since you did start doing the research? Right. So the number one misconception people have about self-discipline is that it's self-punishment. Like it's like you're, you're, you're punishing yourself, you're forcing yourself to do the things. And self-discipline is not self-punishment, it is self-respect. It is you respecting your commitments to yourself. It is you living life aligned with your goals, with your values, with your aspirations. It's you prioritizing the things that you say are most important. So actually living that day in and day out. And so when I realized that self-discipline is it's not just about building habits, having a morning routine, productivity, time management, all of that is a small part of self-discipline. Self-discipline is really you living in alignment with who you want to be, with the life you want to live. I know and in the the kind of spiritual world, which you said you meditate an hour a day. So you've probably seen this, but I was recently just interviewing somebody about how, about creativity. And I talked about how I oscillate between my self growth and spiritual growth and then like my success. And when I'm really looking at my self growth and spiritual growth, for some reason, discipline really isn't in the center of my mind. I'm thinking more about how to allow and be and, you know, be easy on myself. Right now I'm, I'm diving back into that success. And, and so I've got to like get my, <laughs> I have my stern inner voice. It's like, bitch, get up and do this, you know, <laughs> versus it's okay, sweet love. <laughs> and so I'm curious, what are, you, are the benefits of self-discipline and coming from the, the viewpoint of a meditation teacher, when do you lean into that versus the more allowing and following what is and and you know all of the kind of woo woo spiritual messages we get these days <laughs> yes uh I, yeah i love this question and i can speak for a very long time but i'll try to be brief <laughs> so um if you if you look at uh, traditional spirituality you know the the buddhist monks the yogis the the shamans and and people have you know practice and created these traditions and passed them on for centuries the idea of self-discipline is is at the core of that you know um spiritual growth is an exercise of self-discipline if you think of um all the practices that that we see in spirituality be it meditation prayer uh body work breath work um developing your qualities working with your shadows like all of these things require some self-discipline you will not always feel like doing them if you want to change yourself you want to develop more awareness that requires self-discipline you need to be constantly watching yourself making sure that you are aligning yourself with the with the principles that you that you follow and that you believe in so um 
self-discipline and spirituality were always kind of best friends from, from time immemorial. It's only in this last century, in this last few decades, that um, a lot of what's happening in the spiritual space, especially in the West, it's more, um, we can call it more new agey type of spirituality, um, that it's all about living in the moment and all about flowing. And this is important and this is pleasant and it feels good and, you're, and we're happy when we do that. But I feel that focusing only on that is missing a big part of the story. Oh, that's a great answer. I feel like I've been trying to put those two pieces together for a while. And then it makes it difficult to really lean into one of them fully because I'm always kind of doubting, like, you know, should I be more disciplined about this? Or, you know, should I be so focused on this? Or should I be more in the moment? And I think you can be in the moment when you're self-disciplined. It's a very in the moment thing because a lot of my discipline is trying to put myself back into that moment rather than getting distracted with some past thing or some future worry or I don't know what's going on on Instagram. And so I'm glad that we <laughs> kind of weeded through some of those misconceptions because I do think we we believe that we're going back to these ancient practices sometimes, but we're taking our own interpretation of it that m it might not be what it was originally intended for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There, are, there are lots of misconceptions and cliches that we we tend to believe about these ancient traditions that that are not true. For example, if you know living in the moment is important. If you live in the moment, ninety five percent of your suffering disappears. Right? It, it your suffering typically belongs to the past or the future. But does that mean that living in the moment is the most important thing and it's always the answer? I would say no. Our brain has the capacity to think about the past, to reflect on the past, to learn from it. Our brain has the capacity to have a vision about the future, to project our thoughts and ideas into the future, and to try to mold our life so that that becomes a reality. And animals don't have this capacity. Animals are always only in the moment. So our next step of evolution as human beings is not to lose the capacity to be in the past or in the future, but to be in control of our faculties, that when we want to be in the moment, we can be in the moment. When we want to plan the future, we can do that. When we want to learn from the past, we can do that. Because if we don't learn from our past, we tend to repeat it. So it's important. It's important to, to be able to be in the moment, but also to be able to... Uh, Think about the future and think about the past. I like to say playfully that if you live as if you have no future, you will have no future. I, when I think of self-discipline, the first thing that comes to mind is like a series of habits. And you, and you even said it in the beginning, like you do these things every single day. But you make a point in your book about how habits aren't enough. Why not? Because not everything can be a habit. Um in the in the blogosphere these days about habits and behavior change you know it's there's this idea that self-discipline is not reliable and that willpower is not reliable and the only thing we can do is to rely on quick hacks to build habits and that is the most effortless way that is the only thing that works now that's the problem because first not everything can be turned into a habit right so life is just too unpredictable I can create a habit of meditating 20 minutes every morning. So that can be a habit. I can have a habit of doing gratitude journaling at the end of the day. That can be a habit. But self-discipline is more than habits. It's about living aligned with your values. If one of your values is to build a happy family life, you're going to need to have self-discipline for that because at times you will feel like saying things or doing things in the moment out of impulse that are not going to help that aspiration. And in that moment, no habit is going to help you. You need to have awareness and you need to have willpower to, to change the behavior that would otherwise be a minus one in your life to something that is going to be a plus one. So habits are important, but they are not enough. We need to have the ability to cultivate awareness and willpower so that we can live aligned with our values. For example, um, I take a cold shower every morning. I've been doing this for nearly seven years now. And it's habit that takes me to the cold shower every morning. But it's willpower that turns on the tap when I know it's going to be cold. So we also need willpower. 
I, when I was really trying to cultivate my habits, which like you say, is a really important part. I think it's, a, it's one of the facets of self-discipline. It just makes it easier. So you're not using willpower every single time. Eventually you're like, okay, I'm just falling back into my pattern. And I have a pretty extensive morning routine, but I will say mine feels a lot better than yours. I did, <laughs> I did the cold shower thing for a while. My husband does it every single day. And uh, we kind of have this routine now where I just kind of make fun of him for it. So I'm just like, I'm going to go be cozy in my blanket while you go turn the cold handle of steel and <laughs> jump in and scream to yourself silently. But uh, I, I do know I'm, I'm probably going to get back into it soon. But another one of the things that you talk about that isn't enough that I know is also really important in cultivating habits is is setting up your environment for your success. And I'm reminded of why it's not enough. And one of the, one of the, my probably greatest feats of self-discipline was in my late twenties. Uh, I was overcoming an eating disorder. I had a really severe case of bulimia and one of the, for years, and even now I still do this. Like I don't buy things that I don't want to eat. <laughs> like I might want one. If I only want one, I'm not going to buy a pack because I will end up eating the whole thing. It's just how I am. And so it's, that's easy to do at home, right? Of, mm -hmm. of just not buying the things that you're not going to eat. But then the problem is, is I go to a Halloween party or I go to a Christmas party and, and if I'm only ever relying on the environmental factors and I'm not strengthening any other area, then I'm very limited. I'm like restricted. Right. And I, I can see that causing almost like anticipatory anxiety of going anywhere because you're like, well, how can mm -hmm. I exist somewhere else? It's not set up exactly as I need. Right. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that's the perfect example. And also what do you do if you want to stop eating ice cream for a while and your partner loves ice cream and not having it at home is not an option because he wants ice cream. So, um, <laughs> What I say is that it's it's good to be able to tweak the environment to support our self-discipline, but we can't rely it. Um, we can't rely on the environment for self-discipline. And, and that's another thing that many people are spreading these ideas. And I think it's incredibly disempowering that if you look at, um, at um, us and other animals, the more evolved is the animal, the more they are able to thrive despite the environment. Like we, we, we have created cultures and we have lived and grown in all areas of this earth in spite of adverse environments so personally also you cannot control your environment you can control your responses you can control your choices you cannot control your environment you if you can be in a place that the environment is always perfectly supported supportive to your habits wonderful right but that's rarely feasible it, it rarely happens and if you are able to do that you're not going to grow in terms of willpower. And one day when the environment is not helpful, you will not know what to do. So it's it's good to tweak the environment to support our journey, but also not depend on the environment. You specify often in your book, mindful self-discipline. Do you view all self-discipline as having ele elements of mindfulness or are you referring to something specific uh, like a, a different way to view self-discipline when you specifically refer to it as mindful? Mm -hmm. Most people who talk about self-discipline these days, it's it's very much the, the willpower approach, the mental toughness approach, the that bulldozer approach and force yourself to do the things that you want to do. And that's it. Uh, I, I call this the military self-discipline. It works for some people, but not for everybody. And it does take a lot of energy. I compare this as pushing a boulder uphill. Now, my approach to self-discipline, call it mindful self-discipline. That is awareness first, then willpower. When you start with awareness, when you start with reconnecting with your aspirations, with what's important for you, and you develop the awareness tools via meditation, reflection, journaling, etc. When you need to exercise with power, that will feel more aligned. That will feel easier. Instead of a push, pushing a boulder uphill, it will be rolling it downhill. So that's the key difference that awareness and willpower are the two wings of self-discipline. But in the military version of self-discipline, it's all about willpower. And in mindful self-discipline, we pay attention to willpower, but we start with awareness. And that makes everything else easier. Another difference is that in mindful self-discipline, 
we don't believe in shaming yourself, being super critical and blaming yourself. When you notice that you are off track, you just become aware. That is a point of growth. You become aware that, you know what? I made a choice that took me a step away from my goals, a step away from the future self I want to be. And now I can see this. And that moment of awareness can make you feel uncomfortable, right? But you are just seeing, you're not adding shame and blame and self-criticism on top. And then you follow that with an intention. How, what will I do different tomorrow? And that's enough. Just awareness and intention is not enough. Beating yourself up, not required. I totally agree with that because I find when I allow myself to beat myself up, it starts a spiral and then I almost become the demon I'm trying to get away from. It's like, I, I, I have an extreme personality, so I don't, <laughs> there's plenty of people who relate, but I, I know that uh, I'm going to go back to my eating disorder because it's just, it's what comes to mind when I think of willpower and self-discipline and trying all of the ways. And it's like, I couldn't get myself to not do certain things when I was just not getting myself to do certain things. First of all, I had to really connect to that deeper why. Like, why does this mean something to me? It's like, oh, I'm slowly killing myself day after day. Um, I can't get become intimate with anybody, including friends, because I'm so afraid they're going to find this out about me. Uh, all sorts of stuff, like bad hair, bad nails, bad skin. Like, I just wasn't getting nourished. It was... So, it was so important to me, but I couldn't see why so long because I had all of these false narratives in my head of like, oh, but I don't want to be this, but this is, I started this to avoid this and all sorts of things. And so I would start a shame spiral when I would slip. And sometimes I would go days or weeks without falling into old habits. And then I would slip up once and I would just feel like a failure and I would let myself feel like a failure. And my inner voice was reflecting that I'd feel like a failure. And never once did that technique cause me to get up and say, okay, I'm going to do better. Instead, right. it would start like a whole three-day binging and purging cycle. And then I would feel like crap and be like, okay, I need to start over again. <laughs> and so right. that not beating yourself up is, is so important, whether it's some big kind of, you know, life damaging thing like I had, or if it's just like, you're not following your goal. You're not, you're not allowing yourself to become the person that you really want to become. And I think that's what, when we're thinking of big goals, uh, it's easy to just think of it as like this material thing. But if we really get to the bottom of it, usually it's because we want to be somebody who creates that, or we want to be the person that makes this difference. And so you said that we start with awareness. What are those first steps? What do we really need to become aware of so that we're in line with, uh, or aligned with that deeper purpose to make the self-discipline journey a little easier. Mm -hmm. And before I, I talk about that, I just want to touch upon this topic that you mentioned because it's really important. There is a research literature on this and they have called it the what the hell effect or the what the hell loop. So basically you have a, an intention, which is a positive intention. Let's say I will stop eating ice cream for a month and then you find yourself eating ice cream. Then you shame yourself. And when you shame yourself, you're creating emotional stress. You are in a, in a state that is emotionally painful. And what do we do when we are in a state that is emotionally painful? We seek relief. And what better way of seeking relief than going again for that instant gratification? So the, the shame, instead of preventing you from doing the thing that you don't want to do, it actually puts you in a cycle that you end up doing it again and again. And that's exactly the example from your own life. So that's why... Um, Self-violence, be it shaming, repression, etc., doesn't work. Now, coming to your question, um, what are the steps? So in mindful self-discipline, I talk about three pillars, aspiration, awareness, and action. Aspiration is to know your purpose. Awareness is to remember your purpose. And action is to live your purpose, to make decisions that advance your purpose. So in very broad terms, these are the three pillars that we need to live life aligned with our values. Is there a, a, a goal or um, an intention that you can um, give me as an example? It could be of yours or a, 
a client, yes, a leader. I have like five now. I told you I'm getting back into my success mode. I had a baby right. who's 18 months and I was really leaning into that. And now I'm like, I have a lot to accomplish before this next baby. So I have a course that I'm getting out by the end of October. Mm -hmm. And if you want something a little bit longer term, you can pick and choose which one you want. I want to write a book within the next two years. I, I need to do this. It's like starting to feel like an ache mm -hmm. instead of just a desire. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what would the book be about if you can share? I have three ideas. One of them is mm -hmm. the daily mind love. Uh, and it's just going to be almost like a daily devotional style that takes my morning mind love emails I already use with a little extra insight and a journaling question. Another one's more of an autobiography, my whole story because it's crazy. And then the third one is just kind of a short how to maybe on finding your purpose, uh, something that's not so in depth, that's a good business builder. So I can't mm -hmm. decide which one I'm going to start first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, let's, let's pick uh, as an example, this, th this goal of wanting to write a book in two years. So, um, we would see like, is this, is this goal? What is behind this goal? Like what is deeper than this goal? You want to write a book? Is it because if we look at the deeper value behind it, is it a value of legacy? Is it a value of business growth? Is it a value of self-expression? What is it behind for you? You know, I think you just gave the three adjectives that go with each book. <laughs> the autobiography, I feel like, needs to get out there. It's the legacy. I need to tell this story. The Daily Mind Love is more to inspire. It's like the self-expression. It's the book that I want to have a little to add to my morning routine every single day that inspires my journaling. And then the other one's a business growth one, you know, short and to the point, one that's just easy to get your name out there, easier to book yourself on other podcasts, uh, get mm -hmm. press, all that sort of thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> so um, you would, you when you start with any goal, you'd start by reconnecting with the deeper need behind that goal. Let's say if it's the, lead, the need for um, inspire other people, you know, perhaps that's a deep value for you that you, that you feel great when you're inspiring other people. Maybe that's what got you started with mindlove.com and this website, right? It's it's in your soul DNA, so to speak. So you can live a life that is more aligned with that value, meaning that you are embracing that value more fully and allowing it to dictate what you do and 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 give the direction of your of your business and your life. Or you can live a life that doesn't honor that so much. And these two lives, they feel very different. So if you think of yourself five years from now and you have um, fulfilled that aspiration versus another version of your future self five years from now that hasn't fulfilled that aspiration, you see that these two selves, they feel very different. One of them feels fulfilled. Um, I have found my place in the universe. This is feeling great. And the other one's like, oh, I still have, I haven't done that thing yet that I wanted to do. There's a sense of, of regret or frustration. So the work that I do is to typically get people to find that deeper need, the deeper why behind their goals. And it's typically like it's it's a hour long thing or more. This is just giving you an idea. But when you connect to that deeper why, then you know that writing a book, it's not just about writing a book. It's not just about having something with your name printed on. It's an expression of what you really care about in your life after college so that is an aspiration to have a go for it go for uh, it if you have more to say you can continue your answer no so that's just a, a brief example of the aspiration pillar you start by having a really clear idea of what you want and why that is um, important for you and here you have both clarity and motivation to embrace that when i uh finished college or left college, I should say. It was a really tumultuous time in my life. This was when a lot of my traumas hit me. My dad died, uh, just a lot of, a lot of things. Sexual assault had happened a little bit before and it, everything was piling up. And I really went through a huge shift in my own beliefs about myself. And so I'd always been the person that, you know, got straight A's, did really well. And then all of a sudden I was, I just, a few years went by where I started to develop the belief that I was not the type of person that could really accomplish anything. And the biggest game changer for me, I had to hit that point of like, okay, what I'm doing is not working. I need to try something else. And actually following the things I was learning in books rather than just reading it and thinking somehow it was going to apply to my life, even if I didn't 
take any action and just found a new book. And so a big part of that process was going back and, and figuring out like why, what's the deeper why behind this and, and all the facets of it. Like, what is, what do I, who do I want to be? Or do I want my ideal day to look like? Why do I want this? Why is it so important to me? And not just stopping there, but going layers and layers. Like, why do I want this? Oh, so I have a book out. Why do you want a book out? Oh, to help my business. Why do you want to help your business? Oh, to make more money. Why do you want to make more money? Oh, so I can live a life of this and blah, blah, blah. And everything comes back to like this layer of freedom. And so mm -hmm. I had to find that. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it was like, I was like a rocket ship. I launched this podcast and I never looked back. And it was the first thing in a long time that I not only finished, but it's it continues to fuel me day after day. And what's mm -hmm. funny is that in the process of kind of similar to what we're talking about, of like beating ourselves up and forgetting why and forgetting what I had even decided, especially having a baby. I think there's so many identity shifts in that and like what I expected for myself. And I wasn't always the type of person who wanted a baby. It was like a decision I made when I was 30 ish. And so then feeling like I'm losing the person I was becoming and becoming this new person and being proud one moment and then feeling like, like I should be working on my goals more and the, the next. And so if I'm being really honest with myself, there's been times in the last year that I felt a little bit lost. And just recently I was like, I was meditating and journaling, really getting into those morning routines. And I think that I was able to see this because of the space that I've been creating, you know, first just create that structure. And then now all these ideas are flowing and I can feel myself uh, coming to conclusions again, I can feel myself not beating myself up for a very conscious decision I made to focus on my baby for a year. And mm -hmm. now I'm, I'm ready to go again. But I know that I have to sit down and I'm journaling every day again on, on why do I want this next step? And I think we think we do mm -hmm. it once and that's all we need. And then we're going to accomplish our goals forever. But I think it's important to remember that there's seasons and you might have to come back to that exact same routine or structure that you created before you might have to do those same exercises to get to the why of different steps right. and even the same journey. And I know one of the things that you talk about is when you're setting these goals for yourself is that there's a difference between goals and aspirations. What is that mm -hmm. difference? So an aspiration is more connected to your core values. It's who you want to become. It's what you want to live. And a goal is a, is like a project that is connected to the umbrella of that aspiration. So let me give you an example. One of my coaching clients, he has the aspiration of um, creating original music that inspires people, right? That he's a musician. And so his aspiration is to create inspiring, uh, inspiring music or music that heals people. Sometimes he says it like that. So that is his aspiration, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, he's probably still going to have that aspiration and still be working on it. It's a lifelong thing. Now, within that aspiration, there's going to be many goals. The goal of write and publish this song. Now, that's one goal that helps him live and advance that particular aspirations. So aspiration is lifelong and goals are projects, short-term projects that have beginning, middle, and end and help you express or fulfill that aspiration. Another thing that you talk about when you're creating these goals is creating smart goals. And I know that mm -hmm. smart goals isn't a new idea or a brainchild of yours, but it's something that we haven't touched on on this podcast in years. So what are those ways to create your goals with that smart, <laughs> with the little smart checkbox next to it, rather than just, you know, writing shit down? Right. So, um, imagine that one of your, um, aspirations is that I want to be always full of health and vitality. I want to feel young and I want to feel full of energy, right? That's the aspiration. Great, it's an aspiration related to health. Now we need goals because the aspiration by itself is a wish. It's like, I want to go in that direction, but I'm, I'm not doing anything about it. It's just a wish. Now, when we translate it into goals, then it starts to become concrete. But not all goals are created equally. We can set goals in a way that give us clarity and push us forward or we can set goals in a way that we're kind of happy that now we have a goal but we're not taking action so for example one of your goals related to that aspiration might be um i want to improve my nutrition right so so that is a goal but that's not a smart goal like what does that actually mean 
How, how, how do you do that? That's more like a guideline. Now compare that to a goal that, um, you know, uh, by the end of the year, I want to not eat processed sugar anymore. Like that, that's a very specific goal. You know, if you are, you know what to do, you know, if you're making progress or not, or another health uh, related goal that um, I want to make sure that I sleep eight hours every night, starting from tomorrow. No, that's super specific. That's measurable. You know if you have achieved it or not. You know what you need to do. So when you have smart goals, goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, that, that is the type of goal that pushes you forward, that keeps you motivated. If anyone listening to this, if you're not motivated to take action on your goals, it's very likely that the cause of it is because the goals are not smart. If your goals are smart and you're still not motivated, maybe that goal is not connected to a real aspiration of yours. And then what about when we're kind of differentiating between being goal oriented and process oriented? I'm just trying to really pack around this whole, like, how do we create the goals? What are we looking for? Like, how do we approach our days when we're, when we're really trying to achieve these goals? And so, the goal oriented to me seems like, you know, maybe the the GPS destination where maybe the process oriented is kind of zooming in to the day to day. Yeah, so I, I love that you ask really good questions and intelligent questions. You know, I've been interviewed in many podcasts. Most people just ask very vague questions. So I, I'm really happy that you ask good questions. Um, that's a discussion that you no know, many people have or some some people emphasize being goal oriented. Other people emphasize being process oriented, and I felt like both these things have goods and bads in them. They all have the story. Each of them is half the story. If you are only goal oriented, then you know like this is what I want to be. This is where I want to get to. This is what I want to achieve. But at times you may feel like it's it's such a long journey that I, you don't feel excited about doing something for it today because it feels so far away. It feels like you're not making progress because you're only looking at the final destination and it doesn't seem any closer. So this type of approach, um, it has the advantage of keeping you really focused and purposeful, but it doesn't help with motivation. It doesn't help with perseverance. Now, the opposite approach, which is to be process oriented. It's almost like you forget about the goal. And if the goal is to write a book, you know, that there are so many milestones and there's so much work ahead of you. But if the work is to write a book, then being process oriented means I'm just going to show up and write a thousand words every day. Like, okay. Or um, that's good. That's in a way better than just being goal oriented. But if you forget why you're doing that, you may just kind of be writing aimlessly, or you may spend uh, a year doing research on the topic forgetting that you have to eventually finish the phase of research and begin writing because you have a goal. So I, I, I compared this with a, a sailor uh, wanting to get to a destination. If he's only looking at the destination and the map all the time, no, he's not sailing the boat. If that person is just sailing the boat, but is not checking in with the, with the GPS, with the destination, with the map from time to time, uh, you're sailing effectively, but you may end up in another destination. So we need to focus on the goals and we need to also focus on the process, both of them. It really reminds me of what we we're just talking about of why habits aren't enough. That's the, that's kind of the process, you know, of, of getting there. But if you, for, if you don't have that deeper, why of that bigger aspiration, then it's hard to even continue to show up for that process because what are you even doing there? And the last thing I want to really define around the goals is, the difference between want to and have to goals. How do you approach that? Mm. So a, a have to goal is something that we have got from outside. People around us are pursuing that or our parents uh, directly or indirectly gave the idea that that is something worth pursuing, that that's what we should do. So we feel that we have to do it. It's not, there's no intrinsic motivation about it. It's just like, Everyone's got a PhD, so I need to get a PhD. Or everyone is driving a good car, so I need to work harder to drive a better car. It, it, it doesn't come from within you. And these type of goals, they, they don't motivate you so much. It's almost like you're living for other people. You haven't found your center, your, your why, your, your deep values yet. 
Now, want to goals feels completely different. It's what you want to do, what you're passionate about. You, you could be the only person on earth and you still feel like doing those things because they come from within. And for me, this is a part of a, of a bigger conversation, which is, are you living outside in or are you living inside out? Are you looking outside of yourself for validation about who you are? Or do you look within and decide who you want to be and express that into the world through your actions and your decisions? And these are two very different ways of living. In the first way, living outside in, you will struggle with self-confidence and self, um, self-esteem because you're looking for motivation. You will worry about what other people are thinking of you. You will end up working hard on goals that are not truly aligned with your essence. When you're living inside out, you are living with authenticity. You are being yourself and you will feel more passion. On the eyes of others, you may not be so, of some people, you may not be ticking the, you know, the standard boxes, but you don't care about that because you, are, you know who you are, you know your strengths, you know what makes you happy, and you're honoring that in your life. That highlights for me the whole enjoying the journey. Whenever I f- feel like I'm really stressing myself out, like, ah, I just have to do this. Like, and it can start from a good place. It can start with those aspirations. But for me, I need to continuously remind myself and kind of connect back to that aspiration because if, I'm, if I don't bring that conscious awareness to it, I almost automatically, it could be like the most aspirational goal of mine in general, but then all of a sudden I'm like looking from the outside in and I'm worried about what people think or uh, feeling like an, like feeling imposter syndrome creep creep up or, or whatever it is. And so it's usually that stress for me that is my trigger to, okay, go back and align with why you started this in the first place. Envision that person that you want to be, envision the the person that you imagine created this when it's all said and done, like, who is she? What does she look like? How is she approaching problems? And it's almost like I can like shape shift into <laughs> this whole new mm-hmm. version of myself. Yeah. But so say we take the time to really get that deeper aspiration, understand the why behind it. We, we have a good deeper reason for doing something and we've, uh, padded our environment to make it more likely for our success. We've got these habits. How do we connect that to the mindset? How do we cultivate a mindset for self-discipline so that Mm -hmm. it's easier to basically approach our lives in the same way? Mm -hmm. Well, I I would start by checking in if you have any, um, limiting beliefs or, or attitudes that are not allowing you to move forward. So for example, for self-discipline to work, you need self-belief. If you don't believe that you can achieve your goal, you're not going to work hard for it. If you don't believe that your goal is worth it, or if you are doubting that your path will take you there, you are not going to embrace that path. So self-belief, believing in your capacity to achieve your goal, believing that you are worthy of it, that the goal is worth it, and that whatever happens, you will eventually find a way to overcome the obstacles. Self-belief is extremely important. Another uh, attitude is the attitude of ownership. Ownership is taking full responsibility for your life. And it doesn't mean that other people have not contributed to our pain. They have. But we take full responsibility for our healing, for our growth, for our success and our failure. And if we do that, then we are, are living in a state of empowerment. If we don't do that, we tend to live in a state of victimization and blaming. And that does not feel empowered. So these two things. And then the third one is, are you willing to make a sacrifice? That for me is the ultimate task of the aspiration. If you have found some, something meaningful, you will be willing to let go of things that are not aligned with that. If you, if you say you want this goal or this aspiration, but you're not willing to put any time, you're not willing to put any effort, you're not willing to let go of the limiting beliefs that are holding you back, then you're not ready you're not ready for it. You're not willing to make a sacrifice. You probably need to go back and redo the work on the aspiration pillar until we find something worth living for. So that that's, these are three virtues that will help you in self-discipline. And then, you know, whatever you, you need, an example of, of you writing a book, um, 
what I would do is first have an action plan. That what does it look like for me to achieve this goal? Uh, the phase one is I'm going to do research. Phase two, I will write an outline. Phase three, I'll write the first draft. Phase four, I'll get it edited. Etc. So you have Thank a, you for a doing general... my action plan for me. <laughs> <laughs> there you Let's go. go. Write this down. <laughs> uh, and uh, in the beginning, I, I did not have this figured out, by the way. But after creating ten courses, two books, they're like, okay, now now I got it. <laughs> so you have you create an action plan so that you know. If you don't have an action plan, it's like, okay, what do I do? But if you have an action plan, all right, these are the steps, and you will feel overwhelmed a little bit because that's oh, just. Before I thought there were three steps. Now I know that there are 20, but it's okay because you're only going to focus on the first step until that step is done. And then you're going to focus on the second and then the third. And it goes like this with baby steps, little by little, you take, you make progress towards that aspiration. And a really good way to embrace that is to make space for it in your morning routine. So if writing a book is something that you want to, is a goal you want to embrace now, I would say, what if you, have a block of time, be it 30 minutes, that 30 minutes every morning before you do anything else, it's time dedicated to your book. It could be writing, it could be researching, it could be thinking about it. So if you do that, then things start moving and you're making progress in that. And after a while, you may, you may see that you're doing two hours instead of half an hour because that, that, or maybe you're just continuing with half an hour and eventually it will get done. So then is when we talk about habits, building habits. Once you have already done you are really clear about your aspiration, what you want. You have a smart goal. You believe in yourself. You're taking ownership. You're ready to let go of things that are not aligned to make space for that. Then we talk about building habits. Okay. The, the trigger action and reward that every author on habit talks about. Then we can talk about this nitty gritty details, but we start with the why. That point you bring up about being willing to make a sacrifice. I, I feel like that so highlights self-discipline for so many people because I've had a lot of conversations with people. It's funny, a lot of people in my life view me as really self-disciplined, but I view myself as not self-disciplined because I see myself all day long. And so they're only seeing the output and I'm seeing all the times that I scroll on social media and all the shows that I've watched on Netflix and all of those <laughs> things. And so uh, it's, it's just funny that way, but the sacrifice part is something my husband and I talk a lot about. And the, the real world example that I think of right now is his business has grown a lot in the last couple of years. And, and, but it's still at the point where he can't just step out of his business. Like a lot of CEOs get to the point that they do. He still has to be very much in it, but he's able to step out a lot because there's other people working there. And so he's constantly kind of going back and forth. We just had a conversation last night and we're like, He's like, yeah, I'm almost there. And he's like, do I need to go grind? I mean, I, I started this business so I can go snowboard and I can have more time with my son, but maybe what the difference is for the people that are 10 levels above me is that they're just hustling the whole time. Like, and so how do you get mm -hmm. used to choosing sacrifice? I know you talk about reframing sacrifice, maybe so it's a little bit more approachable and, and doesn't seem like our like abusive stepmom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, so, th so there are a couple of things in that question. The first is, um, in that case, I would think of, of, of values. You, what, what is the focus in your life? Do you want to optimize for greater business growth and greater income? Or do you want to optimize for more family connection and time for hobbies? And yes, you can find the balance that is right for you, but you need to know like, what do you want to optimize for? And the problem is many times we're not aware that there are trade-offs and we try to optimize for everything and then we spread ourselves thin. So here again is where the knowledge of like, what do I want? What are my core values? What's most important for me? That serves as a compass for us to make that decision. And then um, you asked about sacrifice and reframing sacrifice. There's this quote from um, uh, Rud Rudyard, I forgot how to pronounce his name, Rudyard Epling. Well, you can put it in the show notes. But uh, he says, if you don't achieve your goal, it's either because you didn't want it bad enough or you tried to bargain over the price. Mm -hmm. And the price is what are we willing to give to receive what we want? What is, are we willing to make an offering to the universe to get something back? 
it's um the metaphor i use is like if you are in a hot air balloon and you want to get to another place you want to rise high you need to let go of the dead weight and that's what sacrifice is about it's letting go of the things that are not aligned letting go of the things that are holding you back it is letting go of a small joy for a bigger joy that's that's the way to think about it when you realize that every choice we make is a sacrifice every thing that we're saying yes to we're saying no to so many other things so you cannot live without making sacrifice but you can you know the buddha has said that life is suffering that you cannot choose to live without pain but i say you can choose your pain and and that's important you can make a sacrifice towards the direction of your aspirations or you can make sacrifices that you're not aware of you're you're we're probably very often saying no to our long-term goals to say yes to something that is not as important for me when i'm really struggling with my self-discipline i can always feel myself in this like purgatory choice point it's like maybe i'm sitting down maybe i'm scrolling right now and i'm like do i keep scrolling and there's like this voice in my head get up but i'm like ah but i've already got the momentum of this scroll i can't stop now <laughs> or whatever it is and lately i'm actually really proud of myself this week i've been like just getting up very quickly and like leaning into mel robbins five second rule i'm like i got five <laughs> seconds to act or else i'm going to talk myself out of it but you have this really simple method that I feel like uh, is really complementary to everything that we're talking about. And you call it the PAW method. Can you go into mm -hmm. detail about that? Sure. So PAW is short for pause, awareness, and willpower. And it's in a way the core method of the book and everything else is like there are different methods of willpower. And think about it like you are you're driving to a destination, but you get distracted and you're not paying attention anymore and you're going astray you're not going towards a destination so practicing the palm method means every time you meet an intersection every time there's an option to go left or right you you stop you look at your gps you become aware of what you're trying to do and then you make the right turn so that's what we do in our life we instead of living automatically it's what i call the the default life the conditioned life we're living automatically we're not really paying attention at our decisions and what they mean to our future self the PAW method is a way to revert that. You pause before making decisions that can impact your goals and your aspirations. And just that pause, and it could be having three deep breaths, just that pause allows the what is called as the hot system of the brain, the impulsive system of the brain, automatic, allows that to cool down. And then you can become aware. That's the second step. Step two is A for awareness. Is this thing that I'm about to do going to be a plus one in my life? Or is it going to be a minus one? Is it taking me a step closer to my values, to who I want to be? Or is it taking me a step away? And sometimes becoming, having this type of, I call it radical self-honesty. Sometimes it's painful. Like, ah, no, I feel like doing something, but I know it's going to be a minus one for me. Just the fact that I've paused and become aware of that and it framed that in this way in my mind, already makes it more likely for me to reconnect to what I want, to my goal, to my why, and then make that decision. So awareness to seeing, is this going to be a plus one or a minus one? And then also becoming aware, what's driving me in this moment? What stories am I telling myself? It could be that I'm telling myself a story that this is just once, that it's just five minutes on Instagram, that it's just this time, that one cup never killed anyone. You know, whatever is the story we're telling ourselves in that moment, the excuses, we need to become aware of it. We need to call it for what it is. And then the third step is willpower. And willpower is anything that you do in that moment to shift your state. We are about to get a minus one and we make an effort of the will. We make an intention to shift to the other side. And that could be as simple as remembering your aspirations and what it means to you. It could be applying any of the other techniques in the book or of any other author that you like that helps you shift in the moment, shifting your self-talk. It could be a, a little meditation. It could be an affirmation. If you shift and then you go get a plus one, you have done the PAW method successfully. So that's how we implement awareness in daily life because it's one thing to practice meditation every morning and that's super important for cultivating awareness. 
But if that's all we do, then, you know, we're not taking meditation beyond the cushion. Practicing it in daily life means, can I apply the skills that I'm developing in meditation, the qualities that I'm developing in meditation? Can I apply that to my daily life to actually change the way I live? That's what the Paul Method is about. You're so right. That meditation is critical. When I'm meditating regularly, like my meditation game has been on point lately, 20 minutes, twice a day, first thing in the morning at 5 a.m., but I'm like a different person, like these things that are constantly pulling me in different directions. When you're meditating, the whole purpose is that, yes, things are pulling your mind in different directions and you're practicing just letting them go and going back to a mantra or however you choose to meditate. And I find that I'm easier um, emotionally. I'm more stable, like things don't trigger me as much because I'm more just observing it. But my distractions, when I'm trying to implement the self-discipline, they're, they just feel, you know, like these little things I can just shoo away versus this thing that I have to do. And so I highly recommend the meditation. But if you were to leave listeners with one action item to really focus on uh, from the core of this teaching today, what would that be? Ooh, the summarize everything into a short sentence. Type You're like, person. I have 100 <laughs> action items in my book. <laughs> You're like, buy the uh, book. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, yeah, it's it's the most powerful one would be different things for different people. But when I'm thinking of um of a short message that is applicable to, to many, I think it would be to to know your values and, and remember your values in a day-to-day basis because if you're not thinking about your values about your goals and aspirations you are not taking action on them you're distracted with something else likely something that is going to be less important but if you remember your values if you remember your aspirations then you can live a life of self-discipline then you can live aligned with those values and that leads you to fulfillment well thank you so much for everything that you brought to this interview not only was this interview just one of my favorite conversations of the day, but your book is so action oriented. Like, I feel like I could just follow it step by step and have the life of my dreams. So for <laughs> listeners that are, that are listening and really resonating with our conversation, where's the best place to connect with you and to find your book? So you can go to mindfulselfdiscipline.com where you can learn about the book, the app, the coaching, and you can buy the book on Amazon, Apple books, Google play and, and bookstores. We are launching the audiobook version this week. So for those of you who are audiobook lovers, that's also available. 